Bubbles on what to YouTube. And this was is Hindsight Program. Of all those Sunday, and those murders 9th and those of June, part two. And he went into exile after it all over to Newfoundland. Hugh Tudor, he was best known as Black Hugh Tudor. People look back in the past and they say, so that was in the past. But people should remember, it's not too long ago, we were under the forces of the Crown. And those people that were brutally murdered on the bridge of Killaloo fought for our freedom. And the man that was here, 90 years ago, he's going to lay the reed here today, John Michael Tobin, at 99 years of age, he's over here and went, no I think Michael this is what they call hanging onto a grudge. He killed four people 90 years ago and they're still carrying on like this about it. Uh, my name is Coogan, Tim Pat Coogan. Um, Tudor was a friend of Winston Churchill's. Their friendship seems to have gone back to the Boer War. And he was clever enough to put on a tremendous artillery barrage on the Western Front during the First World War when Churchill was visiting the front. And um, that impressed him. So when the Anglo-Irish War was going badly for the British, they brought in these ex-British soldiers to uh, act in support of the police force whom the IRA were wiping out. They came in 1920 two classes of new force. One was the Black and Tans, and the other was the Auxiliary Cadets, as they were called. They were ex-officers. They left a trail of destruction behind them, and they used torture and assassination. They weren't too particular about who they killed. They had death squads, undercover death squads, and uh, they were responsible for a lot of atrocities, burnings of whole villages, like the town of Balbriggan, they, they sacked it. It was, it was military reprisal, masquerading as police activity. It, it, even their name, Black and Tans, tells you something about the way they were formed. They were formed in a hurry. There weren't proper uniforms for them, so they had, um, I think it was an RIC trousers and a khaki soldier's tunic. Anyway, it was Black and, and Tan and there was a famous Irish hunting pack called the Black and Tans, so they were called Black and Tans after that. And of course, the Irish joke was that the, the four-legged hounds were preferable to the two-legged ones. And Tudor was the actual uh, boss of the Black and Tan operation out of that uh, strategy. You said earlier, for your father's generation, he was the incarnation of evil. How much blood did he have on his hands? He had as much blood, no more and no less, as Winston Churchill, Lloyd George, the other members of the cabinet. Uh, he undertook an undercover military operation. If it worked, he was a hero. And if it didn't, uh, he took the can. I mean, as you know, he had to live in virtually incognito most of his life. Uh, he fetched up in Newfoundland because it wasn't deemed safe for him anywhere in the British Empire. I turned up here about, um, gosh, and then uh, once they got back, I suppose they were afraid of the Irish coming over and making trouble, I don't know, and uh, the government had made sure he was sent out of Newfoundland, out to Newfoundland, away from England, but anyway, he um, came out here and uh, made a home for himself out here. Did he ever talk about his time in Ireland? No. Not to me, anyway. I see was my senior McDermott wouldn't shake hands with him on New Year's Day. <laughs> so, oh, yeah? Oh, no. My senior McDermott was Irish. He was one of the most seniors up in the Basilica. But he had nothing really against the Irish. It wasn't that. It was that the army sent him there. And when you were in the army, you went where you were sent. And he was told to leave the blackened hands out there. And that's what he He just obeyed the army rules. He lived very quietly, and um, his family, he was separated from his wife, and his family were all over there, and uh, apparently they, uh, the daughter told me, I knew Helen later, and uh, she said, well, they lived in fear of the people, the Irish coming over and mobbing them, you know, killing them. So I think they were quite relieved to have him out of the way, too. But none of them came out for his funeral. Mm. separated not long after the war. The first war, I mean. 
They eventually divorced. Stride took a chair by the table and opened his notebook. You knew that your father served with the Newfoundland Regiment for a time during the war? Yes. She didn't look very much like her late father. She was taller than him by a good four inches. I knew that. He guessed that she took after her mother. One of the things we don't know about your father is what he did after the war. Can you help us with that? It isn't a great secret. Although I'm not sure he would have talked about it very much afterwards. He was in Ireland. During the Troubles? Yes. With the Army? Not exactly. He was with the Auxiliaries. Do you know anything about them? It took Stride a moment to register what she'd said and to realize the possible implication for the investigation. The possibility that the IRA might be involved in the murder. They developed a reputation for extra brutality. In the end, their commanding officer, General Crozier, resigned his position because he could no longer support what was going on. General Crozier? Yes. You know the name? It came up earlier, but I didn't know the context until now. What was your father's part in all that? Do you know anything about his time there? He never told me anything about it. But he was there, and he was one of them. There's a man who called himself General Crozier, who had written a book full of lies and slanders about that and ten here in Ireland. Obviously a pot boiler, written with the knowledge that a book full of lurid details would sell like hot cakes. He was thoroughly impecunious, and it wasn't worthwhile bringing a suit against him. But a well-known writer called Desmond McCarthy happened to quote from his book. My promptly issued a writ for Lyle. And luckily, Winston Churchill entertained us both, both Lee and Desmond McCarthy at Charlton Manor. And I was able to explain to McCarthy what sort of man Crozier was and, and quote to him from the character which I obtained from the war office. The result was he published in a leading London paper a withdrawal of his statement and an apology for having issued it. During your visit to Sir Winston, General Judy, did you notice any of his hobbies that he's famed for? Was he doing any painting then? Does what I've told you about my father's being in Ireland during the rebellion mean something? You seem to have a reaction when I mentioned it. It might. You're thinking the IRA might have been involved in this? In my father's death? A revenge killing for what he did in Ireland years ago? Something we'll have to think about now. I'm Robin McGraw. I'm a writer from St. John's, Newfoundland. I'm Paul O'Neill, and I have a hobby which is history in Newfoundland. Did he have many friends here? He had been one of the leaders of the Newfoundland Regiment. He was one of the British officers who, who led the regiment in the First World War. And the story was that Hugh Tudor was one of the few decisive leaders that they had, that the British officers were, you know, changing their minds all the time, giving orders, rescinding orders, uh, waffling on absolutely everything. But Hugh Tudor was, was a man who had a lot of experience and he knew what he wanted. And whether what he wanted was right or wrong didn't matter nearly so much as the fact that when he gave an order, you kept the order and things didn't change. You knew exactly what you were dealing with. And because of that, he was one of the few of the British officers that the Newfoundlanders really respected. And apparently, after all his difficulties with the black and tans and so on, when he became, basically became kind of a persona non grata elsewhere, they uh, were said to have pledged allegiance to him, the veterans, and that they promised to protect him, and that as long as he was in Newfoundland, he was safe. And so that's why he came here. Now, I'm sure there were personal reasons as well. Presumably his family life had in some way crash-landed. You know, he didn't, he didn't have any friends, except here. What would have been his reception when he walked down the street? Oh, nobody knew. Most people hadn't a clue who he was or what he'd done. When he first came over, he, uh, he lived with George Barr, and that's who he worked for, for the Bonavista Salt Fish Company or something like that, and lived on Circular Road. He never came to our house, I don't know why, because mother knew him quite well. And uh, George Barr 
used to call her and say, look, Josephine, I have to have some people in for dinner. And of course, he had a big table. They'd have about 15 or 16 people at a time. And he said, uh, would you organize it for me? And she said, sure. So it was your mother? Yeah. And uh, one night she came home and she said, uh, I had a lovely night last night. She said the dinner was just the way I wanted it. And she said, uh, I even went upstairs and got the old major down and danced with him. And my little brother, he was a feisty little thing. He was a year and a half younger than me. And he said, Mom, you danced with that old tutor? He said, you traitor. Look what he did in Ireland. Because <laughs> we used to hear this from Dad, you see, that he uh, was in charge of the Black and Tans in Ireland, that they killed as many Irish as they could. So anyway, I mean, we called a traitor by her son, I guess. She thought twice about what she was doing, because I don't think she ever did another party. My older sisters remembered Hugh Tudor quite well, and I do actually remember driving down Bonaventure Avenue with my older sister Elizabeth, who was almost 20 years older than me, and she was telling me about how the only time that she ever knew that Hugh Tudor was sort of called to answer for himself in public was when he applied to the Bally Haley Golf Club, and he was blackballed by my uncle, uh, Jim Conroy. And that would have been, well, Jim Conroy died in 1933, so it would have been prior to that. I was told, and I don't know if it's true, on certain occasions, maybe it was Patty's Day or something, I don't know, but apparently at least once a year, he made a point of dressing in his uniform and walking down through the cribbies where all the poor Irish lived, down where the uh, where the, uh, City Hall is now. And he would walk down the street, daring them to take a shot at him. And the most that ever happened was apparently the, the women used to go and dump the night soil buckets over him. Sounds like a pretty over strange story. Over in Scarif and Killaloo, it's not night soil, but songs. Well, I'm Mick Scanlon, and uh, I'm from the, the <coughs> town of Killaloo, Clareman. So, um, all these things were all taught to us, and we were told about them in school, and you'd go home and you'd ask questions about them. Sometimes people would answer you and they'd tell you more. Other times you'd meet a wall of silence, and, you know, you know, you know when not to, to pursue anything. But um, I like the sound. So we'll try. Oh, come gather round and a tale I'll tell of murdered martyrs of four who fell for love of Ireland and love of you on the bloodstained bridgeway at Killaloo. Well, we're right in the middle of the bridge of Killaloo, standing in front of the monument that marks the spot where the four Scarf Martyrs were murdered on the November 16th, 1920. They were taken in a lorry up here to the edge of the bridge on the Ballina side and the Superior side of the bridge of Killaloo. About halfway across the bridge, they were ordered out of the lorry, and for the following hour, hour and a half, there are people, there was a priest on the Ballina side, there was a priest on the Killaloo side, both of whom heard the moans and cries which were, um, you know, punctuated by machine gun fire and by uh, revolver fire. You had somewhere between 50 and 100 members of the RIC Black and Tens and Auxiliaries who were strewn across this bridge. O'er wailing waters meet weeping skies To kill a loop they were brought to die and kill a low by the Shannon side. No, it's greatest shame and the glorious pride. The men were separated 20 yards apart and were similarly executed um, after being tortured, facing. Uh, how is that? Is that right? Who, who's that? Mike Egan is your Mike cousin. Egan was that the cousin right? of my, my, my grandfather. From Derry Bryan. Yeah. And what was your grandfather's name? Michael Canning. Michael Canning from Derry Bryan. Derry Bryan. Very good. Cousin of the of Michael Lee. Yeah. Did you ever hear any tradition yourself in relation to what happened or? I did. Well, I heard about the uh, 
style of the well, the way they died, they were tied in the back of a lorry, as far as I know. With their heads hanging down and dragged across the bridge. Terrible episode in Irish history. McMahon, Rogers, Egan, Gilday. Their dust is one with their metal clay. They were murdered. Uh, the autopsy documented the, the horrific nature of their deaths and the funeral itself took place. Today at the commemoration that you attended, we had the very last person alive to have attended that funeral 90 years ago, John Michael Tobin, holding his mother's hand, he attended that funeral <coughs> and I suppose is the last living connection to, to that funeral. But, but I suppose with the passing of time and with all of the other forces that, that, that influence people and young people, uh, maybe some people have forgotten uh, about the Scarif Martyrs and have forgotten Here we about, come up to the you know, end of the part two. The, the